Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome to the stage Blackboard President and CEO, Jay Bud. It's been quite a year. Um, many of you, I, I recognize some familiar faces, some I haven't met, but I was here last year, not here uh, in Liverpool, but in Dublin at TLC last year, and we spent a little bit of time together. Uh, we've had quite a year of innovation and development and production inside of, inside of Blackboard, and I want to share some of that with you today. First, I want to special, I want to, I want to have, uh, offer a special welcome to our Moodle uh, customers. Um, this is the first TLC that we have Learn and Moodle customers all together, and that's fantastic. Um, in fact, Saxion from Nat the Netherlands have 22 staff here, 22 members of their staff here to learn and to network and to appreciate some of the things. Woohoo! way to go, Saxion. <laughs> I think the, 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 the point is whatever platform you're on, we welcome you, we want to help you engage in that platform, we want to help you evolve as an educator, as a faculty, as an administrator in the, in the changing education environment that we're in. So um, before I go, I have to put this up here, lawyers of course made me put this up here, because I'm going to show you some innovations and some product roadmap, product direction that uh, has to be caveated by this legal language. It, it has not been released, it's coming. So with that said, with no further ado, um, this is the structure of my presentation today. Um, I'm gonna to talk about three really specific things as it relates to education. First thing I'm gonna talk about is industry trends that I think are driving a need for change in the industry. Okay, and, and I really, you know, I talked last time, if you, some of you may recall, I talked about the six trends around education 2020, and I'm gonna reiterate some of those, but there's some different things that we've uncovered, focused on that I want to share with you in terms of how it's affecting our view of education. I want to then move to this sort of laser focus on the learner. Um, we started talking about the importance of the learner at the center of the education process the minute I got to Blackboard a couple years ago. Um, and you're starting to see it in the, through the lens of our products and how we're producing our products. But um, I, I really think it's absolutely pervasive in the education industry today. And it's not a revolutionary concept. I, I've always said there are two constants in education. There's a teacher and there's a learner and everything else is infrastructure around that kind of holy interaction. But I think the learner, we, you know, many, many of us in education lost our way in terms of the central persona, the key person to solve for in the education process. And ultimately, I really do think that's the learner. And we're going to talk a little bit about why and how that's evolving. And then I want to talk to you a little bit about how our, why I think we're the best company uh, to, to help to partner with schools to, to sort of manage this change. Through, you know, obviously we do it through the lens of technology as a technology provider, but we hope we're a partner to you. And I want to show a little bit about some of the transformational stuff that we're doing, some of the innovation that we're doing. I'll show it to you up on the screen, give you a preview, and you'll hear a lot more from Val and team uh, tomorrow during the roadmap session. Okay, so but the first thing I want to talk about is just a little framework around technology, because as our as our um, as was discussed this afternoon in the keynote, and is true, very true. Technology has been discussed and has been implemented in the classroom for many, many years, right? Laptops and devices, you know, have, have, have come into the classroom. I'm not going to say they've replaced pen and paper uh, or pencil and paper because there's plenty of pencil and paper and chalk and erasers and all of those things still left, but they've certainly penetrated. Tablets and smartphones phones are starting to be visible. The question is less, should we adopt technology and more Sort of, how do we do it? And how do we, be mo how do we optimize it and be most effective with it? Um, how can technology be a part of a larger strategic vision for education? Technology isn't the panacea to education change. In fact, it's a component of it. And I'm going to talk pretty, pretty uh, closely about that. But there's a big change going on around us. And I think the industry is currently struggling. They, there's no lack of acknowledgement of the need to maximize the use of technology. I think. Ed, the, you know, faculty and administrators, even students are struggling to say, how do I maximize it and what, what technologies are the most important? How should they come to me? How should they be presented to me for me to, for me to affect the change in education? Um, and so, you know, that was my view two years ago. It's not changed today. I do believe the technology is well understood in, edu in the education system. I do not think it's well implemented in every case. And 
So the re what I did when, we, when I got to Blackboard a couple years ago was I kicked off this process that I talked to you guys about last time around this, this, the idea of education in the year 2020. And what we really did for the first six months of my arrival was sit, and, sit with customers and with ourselves and with the market analysts, et cetera, and really tried to think about where was the industry of education and the system of education going over the next eight or 10 years. We wrote manifestos and white papers and we identified you know, through all that work, we identified six key trends. None of them are, um, you know, a revelation to anybody in the audience. I don't think that me saying, talking about learner-centric education or big data or the globalization of education or the like are unique. Our, it, what, what's unique about it is we're utilizing these as guideposts for us as we determine what we should do in, our, in, the, in the construct of our technology portfolio, not the other way around. Let's build a cool technology and then let's slot it into education and figure out how education can then utilize it. Rather, the, the, the opposite. Let's understand where education, we think the education industry, where teaching and learning is going, and let's start to build for that future. Um, I, you know, nothing's changed. These six trends still very, very much influence our strategic direction. But there are some questions that have, ar have, ar have arisen or arose over the last uh, six to 12 months that I want to talk about, some challenges that I think are particularly important to, to cover. And, you know, many, again, many of these challenges are not new to any of you. You all know, you know, things like uh, rising cost of education, decreasing revenue at the institutional level, things like, um, stu you know, increased, increased need for student involvement in, in the very education process, process of education, uh, things around instructional efficiency, uh, um, personalized learning. These are all concepts that continue to permeate the space. But I want to focus on three today that are particularly, I think, interesting. The first one is around access. And I, it feels like that is becoming the new it term in education as I travel the world and I talk to educators, um, the concept of access. Um, you know, let's take the United Kingdom, for instance. You know, the students from the 20% 20 per, 20 most disadvantaged backgrounds in the system are over 10% more likely to drop out immediately or over 15, somewhere between 15 and 20% more likely to not finish against their degree. That's not a revelation, that's not a new piece of, that's pretty intuitive, but it's a problem. It re, it's, it's a problem around access. The kids that are coming from those environments are not, don't have the same access, access to capital, access to available education, access to you know, the information that's required to ultimately be effective. And so those are things that we have to look at. And of course, Blackboard is looking at, at the, every one of these issues on this page and every one of the issues that we've identified are issues that we're looking at in the context of technology and platforms and how we solve this problem. The second one I want to talk about is um, global competition. In the UK, there are more overseas students taking UK courses from their home country or area not, from their home, from classrooms in, in, their, in their particular market than there are, than there are inside, in the country of the UK. So that says something about physical education, point-to-point -point education versus virtual or collaborative education. Um, this is a great opportunity for the institutions of the UK and all over the world. You know, the uh, Institute of Fiscal Studies, which created the stat, talks about that opportunity, but it requires a different methodology. It requires a different approach to education it's really about distance learning, it's really about virtual and online learning, and you'll see why, given the demographic and location of the students that are gonna be coming online over the next 10 years. Third thing I wanna talk about is skill gap, and I don't think this is, you know, this is in the news everywhere, and I've been talking about it for a while, we've all been talking about it for a while, but it continues to be a problem. 75 million unemployed in, in the world, 57% of employers um, will call out that they cannot find qualified uh, uh, candidates. Um, something about our system is not preparing our students effectively around skills and competencies for the next generation of industry, the next generation of, our, uh, of the business or professional world. Um, certainly system transformation can, can start to bridge that gap, and that's a big, big order, and technology in that process can as well. Not to mention, in terms of all these things, with the UK general election coming, it's gonna bring further change further uncertainty to the education system and how we should operate, and what are the things that are gonna affect it through the general election, things like tuition fees, things like international students in, in net migration figures, et cetera. So there are things that are, we have to juggle, that we have to manage 
that continue to be a bit gray, and we have to manage through that as institutions, as faculty, as administrators, or as software providers. There, there are some really shining stars out there, and I want to call two of them out. Um, please excuse me if I, I'm not referring to your institution. I know there's a lot of great work going on in our customer base and around the world and around the UK, um, and, you know, uh, certainly. The first one I want to call out is the University of Derby, which is a school that is really on the leading edge around data and data use. Um, Darby's really focused on the immense amount of data that every institution has on their students in terms of behavior and, and ultimately in terms of measuring student interaction. They're very focused on measuring that interaction at a as early as possible to determine whether interaction is being utilized and therefore, and, and if not, whether there needs to be some sort of intervention. They're also focused on giving some of this data to students so they can self-prepare prepare and be more self-aware and self-manage their own education process as it relates to benchmarks or peers, et cetera. So data, util utilizing analytics on that data to, to uh, affect the trajectory of the outcome for a student is very important, and Darby's really on the leading edge of that. Talk a little bit about personalized learning, and I'll, I'll call out MEF University in Turkey. This is a new university, a new customer. This is one of the first institutions in the world that you know, is, is operating under a flipped learning structure for the entire institution. So certainly there are institutions that have flipped the classroom or doing flipped learning in programs or course of studies, but this is the entire institution is built around a flipped learning structure. It's creating best practices for tech adoption, for blended learning, and for student-led learning. And, and um, I want to call out Dr. Caroline Kerbin, who's in the audience from M MEF. Uh, welcome, and wonderful stuff that you're doing. We're, we're, we're proud to uh, call you a customer and a, and a, and a partner. So cheers. Sorry. When I pause like that, it's meant for you to applaud. So I should have gone over the, ru the rules of engagement. Um, okay, so second part of this presentation. Lots of things happening, trends, changes, some of which you, know, you knew about, maybe some data that you didn't have, but Lots of changes that are affecting you in your institution, in your university, in your environment. But I think really the biggest trend out there, the biggest thing that's changing right now, again, as I mentioned in my opening, is the evolution of the learner themselves and their role in the education industry. You know, as opposed to receiving program content, reciting that contract content, maybe being assessed on that content and leaving the education system with a theory of learning, that's very much changing. The expectations of the student are changing, and also the demographic and the, you know, and the, the number of learners is significantly changing and increasing um, uh, um, uh, in, in, in scale. So we need to change, you know, we need to, we need to understand that, and our need to focus on the learner is paramount. It's something that Blackboard really believes strongly in, so when you hear us talk about the learner at the center of the process, about learner innovation, we really mean it. We're really, taking, we're really looking at this very, very important constituent of the education uh, system as the core person, persona or personality as we build our technologies and think about the process of education. And some of these stats are, you know, are very, very telling. You know, you have a growing number of schools around the world, you know, in, in all of our different markets, and you can see uh, the number of international schools you know, obviously dwarfs the North American schools. Many of our we providers um, have scaled in North America first and not international. We're very focused on the international markets, but you can see the opportunity is very large, 22,000 higher ed and a million K-12 institutions uh, worldwide. And you have almost a billion learners in the system, many of whom are not using technologies, many of whom are not, don't have access to the change that we're talking about. This total addressable market is really impressive. It's addressable not just to me as a software provider, not just to you if you're a global institution running global programs, but even local and regional institutions are going to have to are going to need to address this, this, this group of, uh, of, of learners. And the number of enrollments is growing everywhere. You can see the lowest growth rate in enrollments happens to be in maybe the most, you know, over the last 30 years, the most evolved 
you know, education system in the world, which is that U.S. North American system. But you can see the, the real scale and growth around enrollments in places like Latin America and Russia in Asia Pacific and Africa. It's a, it's, a global, it's a global trend. It's increasing the number of, number of learners coming into the system, and it's increasing institutions that sit not in these regions, uh, increases their awareness around how to reach those learners. They're, and these learners that are coming into the system, their wants, their needs, their expectations of education are seriously changing, right? I mean, see, last year, um, I, if you, I don't know if you remember, I showed a picture of my dog, my gratuitous photo of my daughter with her backpack on, and I talked about her iPhone in her left hand, and the school districts forcing her back into this form of education, and she wants to be more fluid. I, I'm not going to bore you with that, that story again, but I am going to talk about, uh, maybe I just did, but, um, <laughs> but I'm going to talk about a different story, but you know, their, their needs are changing. It's evolving faster than the learning environments they're in. We have to understand these needs. Think about, think about this, this set of um, elements down here. Students today, kids today, learners that are coming to the system, even adult learners, e you know, even, even the 20 to 40 demographic, they, they want to engage with applications, with apps, and with, you know, on their, on their mobile device much more readily than they want to do, want, they want to engage with physical print or even PC-based content. They want, they're much more interested in collaborating and listening to their peers in the education process than ever before. The concept of lecture, lecturing to lecture hall, and then going off and individualizing your focus is, is really gone from our education system broadly. And the need to listen to peers and to integrate is very, very important. They're interested in data. We're, this, is the, this is the world of big data. This is the big data generation, and everybody is a data scientist, a data expert. They want to understand data. They want to present it to them in a simple way so they can learn from it and utilize it in their education process. Every learner going into the, whether it's a 9 through 12, the secondary system or um, higher ed system, are thinking about skills and competencies today, I would argue. I would argue that that is not, you know, when I was a kid leaving high school, or certainly going into high school, I wasn't really thinking about skills and competencies. I was thinking about education and its broadest form and wasn't thinking, and may, maybe many of you were, were the same. But today, learners are thinking about skills and competencies and jobs and the right path to employment, and that has to be considered in the core learning process. They want to follow employers from the start. They want, to, they want to give access to employers to their portfolio of learning. And that's something that we have to think about in the context of education. And then finally, um, mo many of the non-traditional learners that exist in the, in the world, and I'm going to talk about 85% of learners in this world are non-traditional. I'll talk about that in a second. Many of them will ultimately get um, skills or competencies or degrees, or, or they will at least attend multiple institutions. It's not just a single institution and that's their alma mater anymore. They're going to get it from multiple places. And we have to think about how does that data flow? How does that data follow the student? How does the student take their portfolio away, et cetera? I told you I was going to talk about 80, 80, this uh, non-traditional learner base, and I want to here, because 85%, I think I said it was 82% last year, it's growing. 85% of learners in our world today are non-traditional. What do I mean by that? Traditional learners, in my, in my definition, are learners that are, you know, uh, like I was. You know, they graduate high school, they go to a four-year university, they live on campus, they go to physical class. You know, what we all used to think about learning, but 85% are not doing it that way. They're adult learners, they're distance learners, they're part-time learners, they're virtual learners, they're not physically attending class. There's, that's the world that we live in and we have to serve that world. And, uh, we need to reach them in a different way because that's the face of the new learner. The reason I <coughs> put this image up is this is my story of, of this presentation. This is, a, uh, this is a real gentleman. It's not just some gratuitous image I threw on a slide. I was in New York City a few months ago. I jumped in at Uber. I don't know if all, I, mean, I heard Uber being mentioned earlier in the, in the keynote, but uh, Matt Small shaking his head because he knows he introduced me to Uber two years ago, which I'm ashamed of because it was ex existed long before that, but I live by Uber now. Uber is this car service that basically prices down at a taxi level and access to, from your mobile device, et cetera. Anyway, he's an Uber driver. This is his, I think it was a Toyota Camry, or it, was, it wasn't a particularly you know, elegant car. I jumped in his car in New York trying to get to a place, and, and, um, and you know, I said, wow, it's, a, it's interesting because you've got your lap, this is his laptop, his desktop, his laptop was open with Learn on it. 
And he had Learn on his like armrest there, or his passenger seat. I said, wow, that's interesting. You've got my software up. And it's unusual because it's not, this is not the place I'd expect to see the software. And he said, oh, this is, this is exactly where I do it because I'm a part-time student at City University of New York, and I, you know, I work, but I part-time go to school. I'm, this is how I go to school. I go virtual. I take two online courses. I study between fairs. This is how I get my information. And without your software, thank you so much for what you do because without your software, I wouldn't be able to do it. I wouldn't be able to get through. This is an example of the non-traditional learner, right? This is the kind of learner that exists today in our world and will increase. And we have to be ready for that learner, ready with technology workflows, but ready with our systems and our educational process as well. So we spend a lot of time thinking about this stuff. You know, I don't think we can be relevant to you, to the world, if we, are, we don't have views. Some of them may be wrong. Some of, I hope most of them are, are ultimately accurate, but you know, we've spent a lot of time thinking about this. We, and we start, we've truly begun um, and, and are in process of thinking very differently about how we serve students in every aspect of their educational experience, not just in the learning experience, but in the entire experience that contributes to their learning experience. We use that information, the thinking process and the interview process that we go through to inform every decision we make around services, around program design, around software design um, as it relates to learner and learner centricity and the learner experience. We think that creates better engagement, better outcomes. We think we're a better vendor to you who are faculty or administrators whose sole purpose in life, in my opinion, is to serve those learners. So if we're serving your learners, we think we're serving you. I want to discuss how we've evolved around this concept over the next few slides, uh, share with you some of the transformational innovations that we've had. Um, I'll talk to you a little bit about relevant and meaningful products that make up our solutions uh, and services that are meant to focus on our schools, our faculty, but specifically our learners. But it starts here. I introduced this last year, and I I think it's important enough to put it back up because I want every single person in the Blackboard ecosystem, whether it's you as customers, my partners, certainly my employees, to think about what we stand for, what our vision and mission is. It's really important, I think, for any entity to have a vision and a mission. It's kind of where it all starts, it gives us a common purpose. It tells you, tells all of us at a high level what we're working toward. So what's a vision? I, by the way, the, the problem with visions and missions in the world is they are defined differently by every group that utilizes them, and so I want to first define it. For me, a vision is what's our idealized world look like if, the, if what we do comes to fruition, and a mission is sort of how do we plan that world, what are we contributing to that world, how do we contribute such that the vision can be accomplished. I think today a world inspired to learn is a very, very fundamental concept, and that, that, goes, that, that speaks to traditional, non-traditional learners, it speaks to corporate and adult uh, people in the workforce that are continuing to learn. It speaks to how many of us every day hit our device to get some nugget of information, inane or not, because we're looking to learn. We want to be inspired to learn. That's, that's what the information revolution has, occur, has, has given us. And I think a world inspired to learn is a better place than, than, you know, than one that isn't. And ultimately, in reimagining education, in our case, through the lens of technology, we can contribute to that. Now, we've done a lot over the last 12 months to, I think, achieve our, you know, to progress um, and, and move toward our, you know, execute against our mission, to progress toward our vision. Um, the top line of things is stuff that we've just done globally. Things like, we have innovated more effectively this year, over the last 12 to 18 months, than I think in the history of Blackboard. You can see it through our Blackboard Labs environment. You can see it through our, some, of our, some of the releases that we've had. The kinds of product um, delivery and product improvements that we've made are you know, staggering when you look at the numbers and you really look at them quantitatively against the past. We've really improved our support environment. We've also done a lot of stuff internet, just specifically for the international markets, UK, you know, Middle East, Latin America, Asia Pacific, all the way around the world. Um, th you know, I'm gonna call out three. I'm gonna talk about countrification. I'm going to talk about consulting, and I'm talking about open, open source. But there are many other. This best local provider is something that I really care a lot about. I don't think you can serve local environments. Uh, education is a global concept. Everybody experiences education. But it is, it is experienced differently by region, by country, by lo local area. 
And we have to understand those norms and customs if we're going to be a good partner to you. So I think being the best local provider, being on the ground, taking requirements on the ground, building software for the market, having people speak the language, working in that environment is really, really important. And that's a hallmark, I think, over the last two years of what we've done. I'll, let me talk specifically about the, the three I said I'd call out. The first one is um, countrification. We need to, we felt very strongly, um, here, we felt very strongly that we have to take our product portfolio and not do what many software, particularly US, unfortunately, software providers do, so US pr producers do, which is build something in American English with American customs and then I don't know, we'll drop it in the UK because they, for God's sakes they speak English, they can use it. <laughs> you know, uh, maybe Australia because the English speaking environment. Or if we take it to a, um, a, a market that has a different language, we localize it. That's the fancy software word for translating it. But we don't really countrify it. Countrifying is the, is the word I use, my team uses, to make that software really relevant in the market, not just translate it. But think about local norms, local standards, local workflows, and build them in for that market before we take it to that market. Now, you might be sitting back and going, well, you haven't, you know, you could do more. There's more things that your software does that seems more North America-centric, and I'm certain that that's true. But I am also certain that we have the most countrified and localized portfolio in education technology in the world. I know that for a fact. And we, all, we are spending more money on this area of focus than anywhere else in the portfolio. Hundreds of specific international product changes have been made over the last 12 months. 30, uh, over 30 specific regional product development uh, 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 contributions have made, just regional, for a local country or a local norm, which doesn't scale globally, but we felt we needed to do it to be in that market. 30, more, 30 plus additional languages that we've translated, learn, and Moodle rooms into over the last 12 months. We're building products for your local markets because we want to be a local partner to you. And that's a really, really important uh, part, uh, part of what we're doing. Consulting services. The other dirty little secret of the US software industry is that we tend to build services teams housed in the US or you know, seated, seated in the US that are meant to serve you as partner, you know, as, as service providers, as partners. And so, and you know, your team here, your international leadership team have been the most vocal about this of any team I've ever been around. But you know, we fly people in from, I don't know, Boston or Washington DC to solve uh, Saudi Arabian problems or Brazilian problems, and then they fly back out. That's no way to do consulting services. This software, it's complicated because it's not complicated to use. It's our job to make it as easy and intuitive to use as possible, and we're still working on that. I'm gonna talk a little bit about the next release and how, that, how that's affected. But it's still complicated in that you're trying to implement technology to solve a real problem. Technology is just the medium to solve that problem. The problem is a process change, and those people have to roll their sleeves up and manage technology as it relates to the process change you're driving. And so we've internationalized our consulting organization. We brought it on the ground here in Europe, in Latin America, in Asia, with local providers that are employed by us so that we don't have that dynamic of US software business trying to stuff their environment into the, into the international uh, 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 regions. Um, so we're really proud of that. That's something that you will see more of over the next, that, that, re, that just recently changed over the last three to six months, and you will start to see that really manifest in your local markets. Finally, the third call out I'll make here is o, around open source. Um, we have made a lot of investment in open source. I was really pleased before I got here to see months pr before, and it was largely driven by the guy who runs International now, but it wasn't in that role then. Um, but the investment in open source for the first time as a company over two years ago through the acquisition of Moodle Rooms and NetSpot, we've been doing a lot with that Moodle Rooms product line to create the base for our LMS on Moodle. So I'm really proud of the, you can see some of it on the left, uh, left side, but I'm really proud of some of the new UI stuff that we've done with Moodle and the Moodle base and Moodle Rooms. We've made it more simple, more intuitive, Easy, more easy to access, which is a theme for our software, and you're going to hear me talk about it as a theme, because 100 million plus learners are on that operating system, that Moodle operating system, and we need to serve them. I'm also really pleased to welcome aboard formally here our remote learner colleagues. We acquired the UK remote learner business just recently. 
we brought them on board. I think there are some maybe in the audience. Um, but this is something that I'm very proud of because it's one of the most well-respected Moodle partners in the world. They have built a strong Moodle community here in the UK and then they're part of Blackboard. And so we are really, really pleased to bring them on board. Um, so uh, uh, welcome to you all out there, whoever's out there from, from the team. But, you know, doing that stuff, contrification and Moodle and, and consulting, and the, it's just, it's not enough. We need to do more. We need to do more, and we need to do more at the foundation of Blackboard. We need to do more at the foundation of Blackboard for the entire education industry, not just the international industry, and not just the international markets that we serve. So um, I believe, we believe, that a new learning experience is required to really achieve the goals of Blackboard, to really achieve the trend. I think our evolution as a company has put us in place to really drive this, to lead this. And we look back and we step back and we said, what are some of the common themes that are needed in a new learning experience, okay? Don't think about VLE or LMS or collaboration virtual classroom tool. Think about it, what's a new learning experience? How does it all connect? How does it all come together? And what could Blackboard do very special that maybe others can't because we're involved in many of the workflows that make up, you know, make up the process of learning as it relates to technology? We want to move beyond the traditional LMS or VLE. We want to move beyond simple grade books and management tools and submission boards and discussion boards. And we want to get to a more comprehensive learning experience. Something that fully meets the needs of today's students, today's faculty, Something that progresses from elementary all the way through high school into higher ed and then beyond in the professional world as careers are developed. We think that these components that are sitting on the slide here, something around redesigned but consistently redesigned portfolio of products, one that has integration as a core tenet for what we do, integration of the tools and integration of the data, one that really thinks about the learner at the center of the process. Everything is about the learner. If we're not doing it and it doesn't delight the learner, we shouldn't really be doing it, in our opinion. And then finally, finally, it should be designed across the student journey. And the student journey, by the way, doesn't just end at graduation. It continues post-graduation because the learning continues. And so um, that's something that we have really thought very hard about over the last two years. And we're really pleased to start to unveil some components of it. And I'll talk about that. So I want to introduce the new learning experience, and I want to talk about it in the context of theoretical terms that I'll define a little bit, and then I'll do it in the context of some of the products that we have. Okay, so um, it's a, I think it's a truly transformational way to approach learning. It defines a connected learning experience, one that comes from the learner's perspective, not the administrator or the IT department or even the faculty's perspective, the learner's perspective, and is tailored to their needs. It, but these four words, I'm going to use these four words a lot, over the coming months and years, and uh, we will do it in the context of the releases that we're doing, but first one is personal. We want it to be interactive, an interactive way for learning to happen, where it meets individual needs, not just group needs, not just administration, administrative needs. We want it to be intuitive. We want it to engage, you know, the, engage the user, something that feels very natural and obvious, something that's, that flows and is delightful. I keep using the word delightful because it means a lot to me. Using your tool should be delightful. You should love being in it, and we want to be that, that provider. It should be connected. So all of the workflows around the learner's, the learner's journey through education should in some way be connected. And we offer a bunch of those workflows ourselves, let alone our third-party partners, but it should be connected. And then finally, it should be pervasive. You should be able to access it anywhere you are at any time in any device, and it should be fluid, it should feel the same, it should size the same, it should operate the same way. So I'll read this, because I think it's a fairly elegant way of describing it. The new learning experience is a new approach to education that fosters better engagement, interaction, and quality learning through the delivery of leading edge technology, services, and capabilities. So we're trying to improve the journey of the student, whatever form that journey takes, through the use of technology, through services, through implementation, and we'll talk about how that looks. So think about a day, you know, 
we want to foster better engagement of the student in their learning process. We want to deliver these flexible, integrated, scalable environments. And we need to do it thinking about the day of a student. And, you know, I could, I could give you 50 days, 50 typical days of students, because all, it all varies. But you can see, you know, a student that's, you know, involved in an education environment might check their class schedule in the morning, probably through their mobile device. Uh, maybe they figure out that, oh, my God, I didn't pay my tuition. Maybe later in the day they want to pay. So that's a different part of the journey. It's not learning, but it's certainly part of the student's journey. Um, they realize that they need to get in this study group to, accom to accommodate and to accomplish what they're trying to achieve. So they attend a virtual study group because they're not going to do it physically because maybe they're a virtual learner, maybe they're a distance learner, maybe they're a physical learner, but they want to access people outside the university or in study groups. They want to do homework um, maybe later in that evening. They realize, oh my god, I need access to the professor. Professor has virtual night hours, virtual office hours in the evening. They go online, they hit that. You know, maybe they want to, um, you know, all the while they're thinking about the culmination of their education journey, if you will, into a professional environment. So they want job board access. They want to represent their competencies and their skills and their, the things they learn in a more effective way to the community that they'll ultimately live in. We want to be able to offer that. Maybe later in the night, they, oh my god, I need this text, or I need this piece of content, I'm gonna, I want to go buy it, I want to go procure it, I want to do that inside my environment. And then finally, maybe they want to check in with their parents, if they're in K-12, or, or even if they're in higher ed, or, or some other constituency, and they want fluid communication. These are all things that a student does. Today, they have to do that in a lot of different ways through a lot of different methodologies. And that's just one workflow. I, again, I'm not trying to solve every workflow here, one workflow. Tomorrow, what we want them to do, fortunately, Blackboard plays in a lot of these different workflows, right? We want them to do it in a fluid, connected way that's consistent, that feels safe and feels elegant and, and is delightful. We want them to have mobile apps to check their class schedule. Blackboard offers student services to run financial aid desks and help desks, and that should be linked into the learning environment. We, we offer that. We have call centers and people doing that for institutions, and that should, that should link in if, if you're an institution that, off, that is a customer of ours. If you're going to that study group, whether it's a study group in your university or a China study group to learn about Chinese history in a, in a Chinese history class, you should be able to go through virtual collaboration tools, through our, through our virtual classroom, virtual collaboration and, and um, online tools. Our next generation learning, and te learning environments should offer fantastic course management. We should be able to manage your personal portfolio right in the learning environment where you're creating the evidence of your education so that careers can be directed, so that professionals can look at you, so that you can look at professionals right out of that environment. Um, I talked about you know, that buying that math book or buying some piece of content. You should be able to do that right inside your learning environment. And then ultimately, you should be able to pop out in, in a communication form. Oh. <coughs> By the way, all of those things are possible today. We offer technologies and services and tools to accomplish this. They're just not necessarily a part of the same experience, right? That they're just not necessarily linked up. Data's not linked up. Interfaces aren't linked up. The workflows aren't linked up. That's what I'm trying to talk about. Think about the wheel and think about the link. So when you think about it architecturally, and I don't want to geek out too much on this slide, but it is a means to try to lay out architecturally what we're going to try to do, what we're trying to do. The top layer is kind of mobile first. We think we should deliver information, the experience, the data, et cetera, through any device that you have, um, whether it's your laptop, your PC, certainly your mobile devices. So should, should, shouldn't be disparate interfaces, shouldn't be disparate systems. We think that there should be an easy and delightful use and user experience. And we're going to show you some of the things that we're doing around that. Whether it's your, you know, whether it's a next generation collaboration environment, whether it's a next generation user uh, learning environment, um, you know, learner focused innovation inside of these environments, ultimately bringing analytics to bear. Um, we, we think that there should be a flexible range of deployment options for institutions um, and for students as they go through the process of getting the information and operating in this environment. Blackboard happens, I'll talk about this later, but Blackboard happens to be the only company in the world that has every deployment option a student or faculty or institution or administrator can, 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 uh, can envision, whether it's on-premise, whether it's we host it, whether it's hosted in the cloud, and we'll talk about that. And then finally, we should amalgamate 
consolidate, and then give access to the data layers that exist and around the student experience so we can make for a better experience, so we can make for a better outcome. And that's, that's the data layer that puts all of the stuff that we're doing. All right, so this is the part where I'm gonna, so I shared the vision. I talked about trends, I talked about the learner, and now I've talked about some of the structural and directional vision around this new learning experience. I'm now going to show you some components of it, some of which that we're releasing imminently. Um, and the first one is around Blackboard Collaborate 2015. Um, and I'll show it, I'll go back to that architectural slide and say, here's where this fits in, here's where that fits in. So it's a, a bit of a road, bit of a visual roadmap for you, so you can understand where, we're, we're, you know, why we're doing these things and how it plugs in. So I want to, you know, talk about Blackboard Collaborate 2015. I was up here last year, I don't know if you, some of you remember, um, but I showed a sneak peek of it last year. I was really pretty proud of the concept of it, but that was 12 months ago. Um, you know, a lot of things have changed. We made some acquisitions to support this, by the way. We, met, we, we acquired a company called Request Tech right here in, in the UK that has really, really innovative technology that made this possible. Um, we basically have redesigned um, with a hot, with very, very high quality, a browser-based web conferencing um, solution for students and faculty and institutions. It's based on something called WebRTC or Web Real-Time Communication. That's that request tech piece. Cutting edge, synchronous communication. No plugins or downloads needed. Faster, simpler launching. It makes distance teaching and learning delightful, you know, elegant, low latency, feels like you're in the same environment. Think telepresence systems or the things you see on the, in the movies coming to the desktop in the education environment. And it's deeply integrated, importantly, deeply integrated with the learning environment that students are spending their time in, whether it's Learn or Moodle Rooms. So with that said, I want to show you live the new experience of Blackboard Collaborate. So let me click to that. And I'm going to get online here. Oh, no. Okay, I can see it on my screen. I'm collaborating right now, just so you know. Um, I see four people, it's, it's elegant, there it comes. Is it coming? Okay, so this is the new Blackboard Collaborate. I'm here, Val's over there. We got a bunch of people, we have Andy, Wade, people in this room collaborating real time. You can see the quality of the video. Um, you can see the wonderful education cap. <laughs> what happened? Okay. Um, you can see the great education capabilities on the right side. This is a virtual classroom of next generation. And we are about to release this in the next 30 days. So all of you will have access to this wonderful next generation experience, user interface delivered through the cloud um, for your collaboration, for your virtual, for, for your virtual work uh, very shortly. So let's give a round of applause to um, my colleagues. Really, really excited about the delivery of this tool. And you should all, you know, I'm sure we, we're going to be showing this today and, or tomorrow and, and through the conference. Okay, let's go to the next slide. Okay, um, the next thing I want to show is, uh, and it's hard to see on this image be, um, behind me, but um, you can see a different interface up there, so that'll indicate that it's something different. This is the next version of our industry-leading Blackboard Learn. This, today, this enables a more delightful teaching and learning experience. It's built on the principles of the product that we've all known, love, and is the continues to be the foundation, which is 9.1. But it's built on a cloud architecture, okay? A continuous access to the latest features and benefits of what we do in our development shop. Faster innovation, zero time, downtime updates, it's got a new world-class UI and UX. You can see it here. We talked, I've talked about this before. I, ta I previewed a little bit of this last time, too. Um, some of the new UI. Now, I want to be very clear. You can run the classic UI here, too. The classic UIs are really good. I'm proud of the, our, 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 our UI on the current 9.1 product, and we're proud of it, so we give you access. You can run either one as you, as you evolve into this new learn uh, uh, environment. Um, there's built-in learning analytics. There will be built-in building blocks that extend courses with Blackboard, with third-party and open-source tools. And it 
I want to be very clear about this point. This includes the most requested and highest used capabilities in this new cloud-based platform, but not all the capabilities. And I don't think we will inc include every single capability of, of 9.1, for instance, because we are trying to meet the needs of the next generation learner and that product developed over many, many years. So, you know, as we move, we're trying to really, you know, simplicity and delightful interface and workflows that meet every need, not over, you know, not over execute against the needs is something that we're trying to find. You'll see this, this is coming. This is, this will not, this is not releasing as soon as uh, Collaborate, but it's releasing over the next uh, couple of months. Um, with that said, I am incredibly proud of our flagship Learn 9.1 product and the things that we've done around it. It is an incredible platform. In, in fact, um, the, the new Learn environment is really, um, is really a is really built off of this 9.1 platform, and you can access in this new learn environment 9.1 and the capabilities of 9.1, particularly the classic interface. We've done a bunch of things on 9.1 that we're excited about: a new, fresh, modern interface, but consistent with the classic look and feel, because that's the way uh, many of you are used to experiencing our technology. We also have built-in learning analytics in this pro in this in this uh, in, in this part of learn. We're going to a cumulative update model, which provides easy to apply enhancements on a regular schedule so you don't have to take your system down. So we're not forcing you to move at inopportune times. So it's e easier to plug and play around capabilities. But we're also gonna deliver really big components, big releases. We're gonna have one at the end of this year, uh, around 9.1, that's gonna bring a bunch of stuff to bear, but we're gonna do it in a way where we expect, our expectation is, people will move to that release by the summer of next year because we really want you on the latest version of 9.1 if you're gonna be on 9.1, but you know, we wanna give you the time around your periods of downtime to upgrade. Um, it, you will have, so bottom line is, in the new learning environment, you're gonna have choice. You're gonna be able to use classic interface, you're gonna use the new interface. Um, we'll continue to offer 9.1, but you can move to the new learning environment. We're trying to be your partner as we transition you from what was to what is, from the last generation learning experience to the new generation learning experience. Um, we will also help you, importantly, through services, through package services, through heavy hand-to-hand -hand interaction. We will help you migrate if that's the route you choose to go, as you go the path of the new learning environment, or, you may stay on 9.1 and, and, and may feel very, very happy there. I want to be clear. Many of you out there, there's a mix. Some of you were hosting, okay? Some of you, were, you're in our managed hosted facilities. Some of you are self-hosting. For managed hosted people, um, it will be very seamless to move to the new learning environment with the cloud-based architecture. It will look, ex you know, you can make it, if you want it to look exactly like your old 9.1, you can. If you want to use the new interface, you can. But we'll do all that heavy lifting and there will be no, vis no it will be, uh, transparent to you. Transparent is the right word, yeah, transparent to you. But for those of you in self-hosted who are running 9.1 right now, we want to give you an environment that's solid, that innovates, that progresses, so, so that when you are ready to move to that cloud and architecture, you're ready to do that and we can help you. And so that's our commitment to you. How does that fit back in the new learning experience that I've talked about? Well, I'm gonna go back to this architecture slide. Again, Next generation interface. Learner focused innovation is happening in these, in this platform, these platforms. All of it, multiple deployment options for these platforms. You can see on the bottom, self-hosted, managed hosted, or cloud. And ultimately delivered through mobile devices. And we have taken, very much taken a mobile first with um, approach to some of the new user interfaces, some of the new platform stuff around responsive design, how it sizes and fits to the mobile device that you're utilizing. So, um, fits right into the architecture around where we're going. The next area I want to talk about is the app area. Um, we're releasing the first in a series of dis specifically designed student applications. Where, so that, you know, and this is, by the way, this is the new interface that I showed earlier on the device. It's going to work with the new learning environment, uh, the, the, the new learning platform around the cloud, the 9.1 platform, it will work with whatever, but it's got that new interface. It's elegant for the student. Academic, uh, academic information literally in the palm of one's hand anywhere you go. 
BB Student works for Learn. I said, as I said, Learn in the cloud, Learn on 9.1, self-hosted, managed hosted, et cetera. Really, really exciting tool. But the difference here is it's specifically considered the learner in the build and the mobile device in the build. So that's a very important piece. So have a look, and, and, and that will be releasing shortly. Another mobile application that we've already released, it's out and it's available now, is the, teacher, is the tablet app for teachers for grading. This is a really cool, again, cutting edge interface, a, a grading app that's mobile, that fits on the mobile device and then makes it elegant to do grading. Um, easily track, sort, and grade assignments across multiple courses. I, I'm gonna read you this quote because I think it's really, and one of the faculty members I talked to said, I love the simplicity of going in and changing a grade. There's no extra buttons to click. I just hit grade and start modifying. So that's the experience we want. That's what we want faculty to think. We don't, we don't want technology to produce barriers to implement change in process and learning. We want technology to facilitate it. It also got, offers text, audio, and video feedback, which creates a more personalized grading experience for the, fa for the faculty member and the student. So you can do that all in this application. So really neat thing. That's out already. I encourage you all to go take a look. How does some of this mobile innovation fit in? Well, it's obvious that it, it fits in the in the anytime, anywhere kind of piece of the, of, the, of the architecture. But it's also built on that next generation learning and environment, um, great user experience, fluid, student oriented. So again, fits in this learning experience. Again, trying to make it holistic, trying to make it all fit, to, you know, make sure it all fits together. Okay, I wanna talk about analytics. There was some talk this morning uh, at the keynote about analytics and algorithmic analytics or, um, or uh, predictive analytics or you know, what does it really mean and how to utilize it. It's critical. I think it's a critical topic. It needs to be utilized, though. It's another tool for educators, for students, for administrators to utilize in the process of producing a better outcome. I want to show you some of the things we're doing in analytics. Again, great interface, great fluid interface, consistent with what you've seen, consistent with the new, new interaction level that we're bringing. This is the student view. So this allows data tools that, right in the hand of the student that where they can you know, kind of understand their own path through access to data. Remember I told you this is the data generation. They want data. They want to understand how they're doing. Unprecedented amount of information is going to be put in the hand of the student. Real-time info on classroom performance as it relates to benchmarks or peers so they can understand how they're doing in real time. It gives the control back to the student around their education process, which is very, very important. They need to understand how they're progressing, and they should take control of their own educational experience. Same product, same, similar product, similar um, approach, but this is now the faculty view. It's the teacher view. Teachers often rely on physical cues or episodic grades to determine whether a student is progressing and whether to intervene. But what if they had sort of qualitative and quantitative information through data and analytics before the student even walked in the classroom or, or, or while, they're, while they're operating in that classroom? That's what this is. It improves the, the opportunity for faculty and for institutions to personalize the education process to that student through analytics and data. So how does that fit back in the new learning experience? Well, obviously, as I said, you're, you've got all these learner-focused, uh, this learner-focused approach with the great, new, fresh user experience. Um, analytics in the, in, you know, is what we were talking about. And again, it's leveraging that big data store underneath to, to really leverage. And that's not, you know, not just our data, not just the data that are in Blackboard's products, but data in SIS systems, data in third-party applications, all of that should be accessible in the process. And we're working on in increasing the data sources. And finally, the, a big, big part of what we're trying to do is produce choice for you and be your partner as you transition, right? I mean, I hope that's been clear. And one of the things, one of the ways to do that is through deployment. You know, many of you out there are dealing with deployment every day. You're dealing with the realities of how to get these technologies in the hands of faculty, in the hands of students, and make them utilized. And, you know, you're very happy with self-hosted environments where you're running it or you love our managed hosting facility. What's new is the cloud and the cloud architecture that we've developed. And we've been in the cloud for a long time on budget products, on notification products like Connect, on uh, collaboration products like Collaborate, and it continues in the cloud. But 
you know, we've really never offered in a public cloud instance learn. Moodle Rooms is in the cloud. Uh, we never offered learn. So this, this, this uh, announcement today, or on the new learning experience, brings learn to the cloud. That's the big architectural change in that new learning experience. We'll continue to support self-hosted and managed hosted environments because, again, we're, all here to, to, we're not here to force you in a direction. We're here to give you choice. That's our job. We, I, I have views on where it's going to go and how deployment will ultimately un, un, unfold, but it's kind of irrelevant, and I'm not a soothsayer. I don't know the time frame of that. So we're going to support that. We're going to continue to support that with, with uh, our leading edge, reliable, flexible deployment options because one size does not fit, fit all, and Blackboard understands that. Obviously, that fits back in the new learning experience in that architecture layer around deployment. So if I were to say kind of, if you said, so Jay, what are the heroes of this concept of new learning experience that you're talking about today? What are the big, what's the big things that are going on? I would say, you know, let's, let's, let's review, right? New architecture around the cloud for our learning environment. Not, not the Moodle base, but the learning environment. A, learner, a different learner-centric look and feel, but always supporting our classic interface as well. Very important because you're accustomed to that and it's good. It's very good. So there's no reason to um, force transition. Um, better integration of the technologies together as a package. That, that implies workflow between the tools. That implies availability, implies availability. So those analytics things that I was showing you, they're right in the learning experience. You can access it from your learn environment, from your Moodle environment, or separately if you want, um, as an example. And that integration also produces consolidated and um, structured data that we can utilize around the behavior of students and even faculty in the, exp in the experience of teaching and learning. We also, I think the other big hero piece is the deployment methodology and the choice that we're giving and not the least of which is this whole mobile first mentality and the focus that we have right now around mobile and the delivery of mobile as it relates to our portfolio. Now, we're not done, not even close. Um, you're gonna see a flurry of activity over the next 30, to 30 days to, I don't know, call it nine months, and it will continue past that. But you will see lots and lots of things that we're pushing our whole methodology of deployment, our, our, our release is changing. We're doing smaller bite-sized releases that can be uh, integrated more effectively. Um, we're changing the way we come to market with some of our, some of our release structures. So I talked about 9.1 and the cumulative um, updates that we're doing leading to a bigger uh, execution in the fourth quarter with an expectation of movement by the summer of next year. So there's a lot of change that we're implementing. We're also, a lot of this stuff is in the process of being localized and countrified. The good news is, for all of you, a lot of the new development that's going on right now is not considering local and regional and international requirements after the stuff has been developed. So I can countrify a product and make it really applicable, and I can still be effective with that, but it's, it, the best process is to consider local requirements in the core production process, and that's what's happening. So that's happening in parallel, but some of it, is happening, hap, some of it comes later to certain markets, and I just ask you to be patient. Um, ultimately, we want this to be offered to anybody, anywhere in the world, in any language, with any custom, with any, with any um, workflow, you know, and we, we are doing our, our best to get to that point. I also want to notice, did you know, I don't know if you noticed, but, and that wasn't just, you know, kind of my art department doing a good job on the slides. Did, if you notice, all of that stuff, even some of the classic interfaces is starting to look the same, right? Starting to be consistent. One of the things I said within the first three months of being at Blackboard is, God, we have a rich portfolio of products. It's really wonderful. But how come it feels like it's a different company for every workflow you're in? Why, why do I, you know, why do, you, why do I have to ask the user to learn. It should all be working together, and especially when you bring it into this holistic experience, it really heightens that need. So I think you've seen, you're seeing that, you know, when students, teachers, parents, admins, IT people, anyone working in our portfolio enter, they should enter a familiar environment, and that's what we're trying to get to. So I tried to talk about the future of education as an industry, as a system, I try to talk about the learner and the importance at the core of the, of the learner in the way we think about education. And then I talk a lot about the future of Blackboard. I want to thank you for your partnership. Um, I want to thank you for taking the time out of your very busy schedules to come here and learn, to network, 
and to appreciate some of the innovation that's going on. It's really important that you understand it because it's going to make your institution a leading edge institution to understand this stuff better. I encourage you to join the many customer community programs that we have out there. They're awesome. I love going. I love being a part of them. And I love seeing that that grassroots environment still exists. And it really does very much exist here in the UK. This is a very dynamic time in education. It's, you know, we are questioning the status quo. We are driving change. Like, I, you know, I told you last time I was up here, I left education some 25 years ago um, when I was a sixth grade math teacher, you know, in some part because I felt like I couldn't make a difference. I felt like I couldn't make, you know, drive some of the changes that I would have liked to do. And I think probably uh, thought, knew that subconsciously because I was really young then. But today we can because technologies exist because openness to change exists like never before. I think you're reimagining education right beside us. We're reimagining education together. And by doing that, I really think every single person in this room, it's certainly my company's goal, and I know it's all of yours, can make a difference in the world. Thank you very much. I appreciate it, and I'll see you uh, around the conference.